consensus. Thank you, Jessica. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. My name is Eva Malona. I am the president and CEO of Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition, MIRA, the largest immigrant advocacy uh, organization here in New in England. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to this important discussion, no full recovery without immigrants. We are so fortunate this morning to have an amazing panel and our one and only Congressman Jim McGovern, I will introduce the panel in a moment, but I wanted to take um, a moment to uh, thank the amazing Mira staff and my colleagues, um, Jessica Kiko and Daniel Pereira for making this event possible. Each and every one of you on this call for the incredible work that you do and also a special thank you to the Fair Immigration Reform Movement and Center for Community Change for their uh, partnership and leadership. Um, so thank you. The past four years have been absolutely exhausting and for too many families, tragic. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the pain, the suffering and hardship by everyone in our community but also recognize the resilience, the strength, and the vital role of immigrants and what they did as frontline workers during this pandemic. Immigrants are doctors, nurses, drivers, delivery workers, construction workers, research scientists, business owners, and so many more of those roles who sustain us through the pandemic and brought us towards recovery. 71,900 immigrants unauthorized are part of our essential workforce here in Massachusetts. Five million nationwide. Also, most of the firms and organizations behind COVID-19 vaccines were founded and co-founded by immigrants. Immigrants account for nearly 25% of all workers in pharmaceutical and medicine manufacturing across the United States and more than a quarter of physicians here in our great Commonwealth. There is no successful recovery without immigrants. We have a chance to not only repair the damage, heal from the trauma, but actually build back together. This is the moment for change for bold ideas, for an aggressive vision for a truly inclusive America, where each and every one of the 45 million foreign born could claim their place and thrive. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us to undo the damage of the past four years and start transforming immigration policies and programs so they reflect our values, uplift people, and enable immigrants to fully contribute to this great country. We must also change the narrative. One of the silver lining of the pandemic has been the increased visibility and recognition of the fact that immigrants are not a problem to be fixed. They are part of the solution as we build the infrastructure for recovery. I am optimistic about the Biden and Harris administration, but I also know it is up to us to keep pushing forward. Nothing good comes easy. At this moment, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you my Congressman, Jim McGovern. We are so fortunate here in Massachusetts to have a strong congressional delegation <laughs> and Congressman Jim McGovern stand out among them for his immense dedication, his knowledge of the issues, and his commitment to his constituents, to all of us. He has an amazing career of 25 years in the House of Representatives. Congressman McGovern and his staff have been amazing allies on Capitol Hill, standing up for hunger, bigotry, human rights, immigrant rights, innovation. Words are not enough to express our gratitude to you, Congressman, for your leadership. Everything that the Congressman does embodies the values we want to see in our leaders, fairness, honesty, and a profound sense of human decency. It is my honor to call you my Congressman, 
my friend. Thank you so much and please take it away. Well, thank you, Eva, for the uh, very kind words uh, and for your friendship. Uh, um, they mean a lot to me. And uh, I wanna thank Mira for hosting this morning's round table. And I wanna thank you also for your invaluable work over decades on behalf of our immigrant friends, neighbors and colleagues. And this is the basic truth uh, that brings us together today. Uh, we are talking about our friends. We are talking about our neighbors. We are talking about the people we work with. We are talking about students who our kids go to school with, the mothers and fathers we sit next to at PTA meetings. We are talking about members of our community. For many, we're talking about members of our own family. We're talking about the millions of people who are here in the United States who have earned a pathway to citizenship. And when I thought about the title of today's roundtable, uh, No Recovery Without Immigrants, I want to be perfectly clear that none of us, none of us could have survived the pandemic without the essential work and services provided to each of us and our families by the immigrant community. Immigrants are the workers who put food on our table. They grow our food and harvest our food. They transport it, they warehouse it and process it. They're the workers on the dangerous line in, in meat and poultry processing plants. Immigrants are the workers who stock the shelves of our grocery stores and other essential services that remained open during the lockdowns. Immigrants taught our children remotely. They served us coffee at Dunkin' Donuts. They, they cleaned up each night before turning out the lights. They are the first responders uh, and the healthcare workers who put their lives on the line to save the lives of others throughout this terrible year. Uh, immigrants also kept those hospitals and healthcare facilities open, functioning and clean throughout the pandemic. They took care of our elderly in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Immigrants, as Ava pointed out, are also in our research labs. They brought us life-saving vaccines and other medicines. And just like each of us, Immigrants looked after their own children and families during the past year, uh, you know, during this quarantine and during this time of isolation. And sadly, immigrants bore the brunt of exposure, infection, illness, and death from the COVID-19 pandemic, along with other, other disadvantaged communities of color. We owe immigrants the authorized, the undocumented, and those who have temporary and uncertain status we owe all of them a tremendous debt of gratitude for their contributions and sacrifices during this past difficult year. But words um, are hardly enough. Um, we owe them a way to regularize their status and a pathway to citizenship. Uh, immigrants will be, will be part of our recovery story as well. Uh, and they're an important part of our recovery because they are us. At a minimum, a path to citizenship for the dreamers, longtime TPS holders, and essential immigrant workers should be part of any recovery package approved by Congress and sent to President Biden's desk. In the House, we passed legislation for dreamers and TPS and DED holders, was H.R. 6, the American Dream and Promise Act, and we sent it over to the Senate. My hope is that Mitch McConnell will not stand in the way and allow the Senate to debate, deliberate, and vote on that legislation. We also passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act and the U.S. Citizenship Act that, was, that has been introduced in both chambers. Now, are these perfect pieces of legislation? No, they're not. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect bill. Uh, but each provides significant protections and a pathway to citizenship for millions of our immigrant neighbors and community members. And they must be part of any recovery package advanced by Congress. Now, let me just say one final thing here. I, you know, as Eva pointed out, I mean, these last four years have been traumatic for everybody. And, um, and we had a president who uh, legitimized hate um, and discrimination uh, against our immigrant community. Uh, he referred to immigrants in the most insulting, uh, demeaning, ways, uh, in ways that, that really betrayed our values uh, as a country. I mean, it was sad, but uh, it was also um, dangerous 
for the immigrant community. We have seen a rise in hate crimes in this country. We have against almost every single immigrant group, and now we're seeing an increase in hate crimes against our Asian immigrant community, all because of the words uh, of the previous president that somehow, again, said it was okay to say hateful things, that it was okay to target people because of who they are and where they, where they are from. And so we, we have, a, we have a, a, a very challenging task ahead of us because uh, we have to somehow do a better job about convincing those people who look at immigrants as somehow not part of our community. Um, we have to convince them that they are wrong. We have to persuade people that immigrants are essential uh, to this country on so many levels. We're all, we're a nation of immigrants. We all trace our families back. Very few of us are, are, are you know, are, are from, we trace our ancestry back or from the continent of, of North America. But we need to do that because we need to create the political will to get Congress to move quickly on these uh, important bills to help give our immigrant community the protections that they deserve, the peace of mind that they deserve, and the status that they deserve. Uh, and so I just want you to know, I, I appreciate all of uh, Mira's advocacy, um, and you have always been wind at our back here in Washington when we have tried to advance uh, legislation regarding the immigrant community, but please know that I want to be wind at your back. Um, uh, you, 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 what we are talking about here today really is, 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 is the best of this country. Um, and we can't let people take that away. So um, I look forward to the panel discussion. And again, I, I thank everybody on the line. Uh, and, um, and uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm hopeful. We have a new president and a vice president who I think get it. Uh, we just got to get these bills through Congress and get them on the, on, the, on the president's desk so he can sign them. And then we can move forward uh, in, a, in a more hopeful way. So I thank you and I, I, I will yield back my time. Thank you so much, uh, Congressman, for your powerful words, for your tireless advocacy, for standing up for all of us. Um, at this time, it is my honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Anne Wu Sawyer, the Executive Director of the Southeast Asian Coalition of Massachusetts. After immigrating from Saigon during the Vietnam War in 1975, Anne established herself in the Commonwealth as an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and humanitarian. Her agency provides vital assistance to Southeast Asian and Middle Eastern refugees and immigrants and low-income families. In addition, she and her affiliated organization have worked to preserve both the cultural heritage of Vietnamese ethnic minorities in their own nation, as well as the culture of immigrants to the United States. Anne and her group are the heroes who have been doing enormous work during this pandemic. So my heartfelt thanks, my friend, for all that you do and all that you stand for. Please take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Eva and uh, Mira, for organizing this important roundtable to allow us to look at ourselves as who we are as Americans. And thank you, Eva, for your kind words. I'm humbled by the work that you and Mira have been doing for immigrants and refugees for so many years. If you look through American history, you will see that this country was not only built by immigrants and refugees from all over the world, but strengthened by it. For centuries, immigrants have strengthened the American society in every way. And they have brought this nation to one of the most powerful countries in the world. And let us not forget that this land at the very beginning was belonged to the Native Americans. During the pandemic, even before the pandemic, immigrants have been carrying the heavy weight. They are the backbones, the hearts and the blood that flow freely and nourish every part of the body of the United States of America. They are migrant workers harvesting the thick smoke of California wildfires to bring fresh produce to your family's kitchens. They're in every city and town, working in restaurants, grocery stores, hospitals, teaching in schools, 
They work as engineers building cars and uh, buildings and schools. They also made signif significant global impact. We heard about uh, Professor Esther Duflo that Eva and Mira honored not long ago, who uh, immigrated from France. She was one of the world's most innovative and influ influential thinkers on the economics of poverty alleviation. And she was a 2019 Nobel laureate in economics. In two weeks, um, the International Institute of New England is presenting the prestigious 2021 uh, Golden Door Award to uh, Uh, to Dr. Uh, Reshma Kewaramani, a CEO of Vertex. She's a model CEO. She leads a biotech company that is solving complex problems. And the story of her family's journey to the US to pursue new opportunities resonates very well with the immigrants and refugee stories that Eva and Mira and Congressman McGovern have been helping and supporting and who have helped make this country one of the greatest. I have much respect and I applaud Congressman McGovern and the Congressman's office for pushing bills to help immigrants and refugees to become significant contributing citizens. Congressman McGovern recognized our strength, resilience and fierce desire to give back to be the best Americans we can be. Uh, I'm asking you why Dr. Kawaramani's award called the Golden Door Award. I'm sure you heard of it via these words. Keep, ancient lands, your story pomp, cries she with sudden lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refu ref refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, Tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Dear friends and everyone here, there's no recovery now or ever on American soil without immigrants. Take pride of who you are, of who we all are, of all Americans are. If you deny this, please look at yourself in the mirror. You will see an, a descendant of a mighty immigrant. Thank you so much for being here with us. God bless America. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so very much. Um, Anne also was uh, honored uh, at the same gala last year, by the way, with the Nobel Prize winner. So we are so proud, um, Anne, for all that you do. Um, thank you so much. I would next like to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Ishmael Surunji. Ismail is a political and human rights activist, a mathematician from Uganda. He is precisely one of those immigrants who brought his great passion for justice and his skills in the fields of both mathematics and medicine to the United States, and will share his story of activism, immigration, and the search for social and political justice. The struggle for human, civil, and political rights is global and Ishmael exemplifies the work being done to address that. We are so fortunate uh, to have you with us, Ishmael. Please take it away. Thank you very much, Eva. And uh, thank you for inviting me on this panel. Um, and I'm really, really glad to be on the same panel with uh, Congressman McGovern and the rest. I'd like to begin by saying my story is unique, but my situation is not. And just like, millions of people arrived at the famous Ellis Island in New York, uh, escaping um, different things. I came to this country running away from Uganda that is, that is still going through a dictatorship that is funded by, uh, some would say, the United States. Um, but ha having arrived here with nothing to my name, no, no coin to my name, nothing, nobody knew me, I was humbled by uh, when I was received by the institutions that have been set up already by the great state of Massachusetts. And, and those would be BMC, 
um, and a couple of other institutions that that, that groomed me to be uh, the person uh, who I am today. So from being nobody, BMC brought me up to to be a, just basic things that, like how to write a resume. Um, where, where, where I came from, it was called a CV, curriculum vita, and just transforming me to be an American just and to be able to fit into the society. And with all the training and with all the love and the care that I, I, I got and I still get from the different institutions, I was able to, um, to apply for a job at CLC Cambridge and was accepted to be a teacher. Now the pandemic really, really hit hard because we used to do um, in-person teaching, but when the pandemic hit, I had to adjust teaching the mathematics uh, online. And that is one of the hardest things that I've had to do in the last couple of months. And one of the greatest things that humbles me and is, is being uh, an immigrant myself who has to teach fellow immigrants because the center where I teach is a collection of immigrants, the people from Honduras, um, Brazil, some natives of America, who just need to get their GED and high set to be able to have a better life and look, and it's me who is helping them to get to that level. And for me, that is a very humbling experience. And for them looking at me as, as an inspiration, uh, calling me their teacher proudly is, um, is something that, that, that resonates to what this country's foundation is built on. And with, with, with all that being said, I think more needs to be done. And I'm not speaking this for only myself. I know I'm just like zero point something because there are very many other immigrants from different countries going through different things. We know that right now, apart from Uganda that is having an issue with the human rights violations, there are things going on in Ethiopia, the things going on in uh, Brazil, Neymar, wherever. But everybody who comes here comes with a skill and is ready to serve. But just like uh, Congressman McGovern said, there is the last four years have really been terrible. You wake up and watch the news, and you feel like you don't want to get out. You wake up and 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 watch. Apart from what the former president was saying, but just what going to the mall. You don't know what somebody's going to say to you because of probably uh, um, of, of how you look. And the hope is now that there is a new president and the hope is now that there is a new vice president and, and people like Congressman James McGovern who have really uh, fought for immigrants and re refugees who have a track record to do that. We're hoping that uh, with, with, a, with a clear pathway to citizenship for immigrants, it would be, it's first of all, the basic things Things like safety, it's very, very, uh, safety is one of the core, I would think. And then the next, just keeping families together. We saw the last couple of years, last four years, that has been um, going on in, in the South, but also just being able to, to, to reunite families, for example. And also the path will ensure that millions and millions of immigrants that are doing tremendous work, that are mechanics, um, that are serving at Dunkin' Donuts, just like uh, 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 Congressman McGovern was saying, they could come out and be able to thrive just like I was helped by BMC to be able to thrive and, and, and show myself to the world. And so I thank you, Eva, for inviting me and I'm really, really excited to engage with the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ishmael. You are an inspiration and it has been an honor to, um, to have you um, I, you know, I'm very moved by, by the discussion. I'm also a naturalized citizen who feel blessed to live in this great country. So, you know, my, my personal and professional agendas are very much aligned. And I, I want to extend my deepest thanks and appreciation to our amazing uh, panel. At this time, I would like to turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Jessica Kiko, the director of the New American Initiatives at MIRA. Um, to facilitate a Q&A um, with the panel. So please use the chat and ask a question. Uh, we have half an hour to, um, to continue this very rich discussion. Thank you so very much. Jessica? 
Thank you, Ava, and thank you so much to all of our speakers for, for your really powerful messages this morning. Uh, we now have some questions that we've been collecting and that I'll pose to our panelists. Um, and please feel free to, to all chime in with responses and to our participants, as Ava said, please put any questions you may have for our panelists in, our, um, in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So we'll start with a broad question, and I think some of you have started to address this, but um, during this portion, we really wanted to dig in a little bit deeper. Many of you have spoken for the need for action and the need for action now. Can you elaborate on why now? Why is this in particular a pivotal moment um, to push for a path for inclusion and citizenship for immigrants in our country? In any order you'd like. Well, well, let me, maybe I'll begin. Otherwise you, gotta, you should be, you have to call on us because we all want to be oh, deferential here. Like right? no, yeah. But let me, let me first of all, uh, uh, applaud the work of Ann, who has done so much in the state, but in my community in particular, I appreciate that. And Ishmael, thank you so much for your, uh, your powerful words. And um, I'm really proud to be on a panel with both of you. But in answer to the question, you know, what's, what's different now? Look, we have a new president and we have a new vice president. We have a president who's not a racist, um, who doesn't uh, demonize immigrants. We have a president who is trying to help us find a pathway uh, to citizenship for a big chunk of our immigrant community, who's promised to sign bills uh, uh, into law that if we could get them on his desk. And I think, so that's a difference. I think more and more people, especially in the middle of this pandemic, are aware of the value of our immigrant community. And we need to make sure that we build on that. Um, and, um, and I also think that there's more awareness uh, with regard to the plight of dreamers and TPS holders. Um, and so there's maybe an opportunity to move forward. But the other reason why now is important is, and I'm gonna end with, the, it's where I ended in my opening statement. This is also a time when, you know, we need to raise our voices because uh, we have to combat some of the uh, the, the bigotry uh, that continues to exist in this country, some of the hate, some of the uh, some of the distortions that are that are that are very very damaging and quite frankly threatening uh, to many in our immigrant community. So for all those reasons, this is a pivotal moment, uh, and we cannot we can't blow it. We 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 have to we have to move quickly, uh, and we uh, and we have to move now. This is Ayn from the Southeast Asian Coalition. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Mc McGovern. I think it's important for uh, leaders in government offices to mirror after what uh, Congressman McGovern ha has been doing. Uh, and at the same time, we really should look at our the strength of our own people in our own community of uh, immigrants and refugees. Uh, the pandemic is a terrible thing, but the silver lining of it is that refugees and immigrants were the heavy lifter for the greater community during the whole entire time. They still working very hard uh, in, the, um, in the warehouse, in the farms, grocery store, hospitals, um, uh, you name it, they are there. And this is a time for us to recognize not only our strength, but also our rights. Our rights as Americans, uh, uh, dwell, American dwellers, we pay tax. Uh, we have the res res resilience, the creativity, the uh, problem solving um, ability to, to make this country a better place. And this is the time that community uh, refugee and immigrant community members have been recognized uh, as the one who do all of the heavy lifting. We have to take this moment as a, uh, uh, an, an important opportunity for us to take the lead uh, in changing, in making our community, our city, our town, our country a better place. And I'm very grateful for uh, political leaders like uh, Congressman McGovern, uh, uh, organization leaders like Mira, who have been promoting more and more of our contribution. And I think we need to do more of that to help the greater community <coughs> to recognize the importance of uh, immigrants 
uh, for the recovery of the country, not only in the short term, but in the long term. We are the best investment, the best return of investment that all Americans could make for the country. Thank you. Uh, this is Ishmael. I, I would like to begin by sharing with you a saying, a Zulu saying that says, Ubuntu ngubuntu ngabantu. And it literally means, I am because you are. And one of the things that I have uh, witnessed in the last four years, uh, apart from the bigotry and, and the hate, is that it's very it's very easy to lose people's souls. And, and by souls, I'm, I'm, I'm meaning it's very easy to lose the trust that people have, have, have got uh, in this country. And people come here um, because of the track record that they have about the country. And, the, and for the last couple of years, the country has been sold as um, they're, they're banning this, they're banning that. But knowing that the country was built on, on, on the backbone of immigrants and, and with this, with the, with the new um, presidency that is, that is in, it's, it's only prudent to have this discussion right now. And also um, the number of, it's also, it's, it's also good to have this discussion now because the number of immigrants uh, are only going to increase if if we don't if there's if there's nothing done about it, it's it, the, the situation is only going to get worse, uh, especially in terms of the hate and 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 uh, and the direction that the different communities are going. And and you could see what's going on. Just like a couple of weeks ago, there are shootings. Uh, Asian hate now is on the rise, and uh, and all. Uh, the beer Black Lives Matter. So if if we try to also make uh, citizens not not be seen as second class uh, people of this country, I think it would go very far. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Did you want to add on this question, or should we move on to the next question? I just wanted to uh, to say that you know just think about the the number of immigrants who are the frontline workers and just reminding everyone that in the agriculture sector we didn't cover that seventy five percent of agriculture workers are unauthorized so how can we not act now and we can continue with the other questions. Thank you everyone for your responses. There's a number of questions in the Q and A. Um, and questions we had collected in advance as well about the narrative um, and the narrative more broadly and specifically the narrative around what is um, happening at our border right now in Central American immigrants. We know that immigrants and advocates have often been on the defensive countering a really strong nar uh, negative narrative. And so the question for you all is how can we uh, work collectively and more specifically, how can MIRA members and our national partners um, as a community of immigrants and refugees, leaders and advocates unite on a message that will bring us all together and help us, as you said, change the hearts and minds of those who don't share our point of view. Um, and Anne, maybe if you wanna get us started on that. I'm mute. Oh, you're uh, muted. Jessica, would you please forgive me? Would you please repeat the questions? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, the question is digging in a little bit deeper. You know, you all talked about the importance of changing the narrative. And the question is, how can, can we, you know, at MIRA, as well as our national partners, um, unite on a message that will bring us all together and help us change that narrative to a, to a positive, powerful um, narrative? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jessica. Uh, I think... Um, we have tried in the last several centuries, we have tried, uh, the uh, Americans have tried many, many ways to bring peace and to bring healings. And it didn't seem to um, last for a long time. The con hate continue to move forward. So I think, um, I think mental health, I have to ask myself why people hate so much. And I really believe that 
mental wellness is an important part of helping people to heal. People angry because something happened. What does it take for them for not to turn anger into hatred for people that have nothing to do with them? But because they look different, they have different color skin, they speak different language. And so I think um, we have to pay more attention in uh, with mental health uh, support for everybody in the country. And secondly, uh, I think we, I would like to focus more on love. As Asians, we don't make a lot of noise. We don't like to rock the boat. We're just so happy to have a roof over our head. We remember how difficult it was for us to, uh, back in our country. And that's why we risk our life to cross the huge ocean to this country where we didn't have the language. We couldn't even understand why people love American casserole. But anyway, so um, we, but in our gentle way, we will continue to fight with our being the best American we can be. In our gentle way, we will have our poetry, our music, uh, our art that will break the bones of haters who are, or will break the haters of people who do terrible things to others. So I think we need to come, uh, every one of us should take advantage of our strength and who we are so that we will be able to change that narrative. I don't, uh, I know it's important for Asians to speak up and to protest and to do all, to do, uh, to make our voice heard. It's very important, but it's wonderful to, to hear what Ishmael said earlier about his culture, to hear what my Karen and Karani, uh, uh, Minor, uh, ethnic minority from Burma spoke through their food, their weaving. Uh, I really believe that we have to use everything we can. Let me cultures, art, mental wellness, our voices, our political power, uh, everything in order for us to change the narrative. Thank you. Thank you, Ishmael. Yeah, um, I, I would like to begin from the, the uh, she talked about mental health. And I, I would like to say that I believe that uh, making a positive narrative about immigrants starts with allowing immigrants to tell their stories. There are lots of, the, the kinds of stories out there in the media about immigrants are not the good stories. And not everybody that is an immigrant, for example, Eva just said she's, she, she's also just a notarized and she's, the, she's heading this organization. And, uh, and uh, also is from uh, Cambodia, is it? Vietnam. 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 So there, there are very many people who have got good stories that people can hear and get inspired by. And it's, it's, but when people come to this country because of the narrative that is already there, there's no platform for people to tell these stories. The stories don't make the news. And if, if there are places that this that that can accommodate people to tell these stories because and and that's why i was very very excited when uh, i was invited to be on this panel because i have a story to tell i lived my story and the burden of proof is on me to to tell the story otherwise if i don't then uh it, it doesn't count but also i like to say that apart from that there is also a need to better support organizations that support immigrants and if they're not supported, then there is no way that um, uh, immigrants will thrive in this country. I mean, they can survive, but they, would, they won't be able to thrive. And, and myself, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm, I'm just one of the, uh, probably the few, but there may be other people that are highly more skilled than me that because of maybe personality issues or mental health, um, they are not able to come out. And, and, and if we had more organizations like the, uh, like BMC and others like Amira that are doing everything to 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 help um, immigrants, uh, they if they are better supported to be able to educate, that would be good. And then maybe the last one, um, also to 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 share uh, success stories from uh, from 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 the leaders. 
and also but just I'll, I'll give this I'll give this example I'll, if if Congressman James McGovern did something very huge about immigrants this should really make the news but no, uh, nobody apart from a few people they are run we are running around with ignorance in our minds we don't know what's going on uh, with immigrants because the, the the narrative the, in the news is 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 controlled so that, that that would be my take on this thank you thank you congressman <laughs> Yeah, well, first of all, I agree with what An and Ishmael um, have already stated. But, you know, I think it's really important to tell stories uh, because people can relate to stories, to real human stories. You know, we, we throw around statistics and figures all the time, but I think we've lost our human ability to feel what those statistics and those numbers are all about. So real stories are hard for people to ignore, uh, and it, it makes it easier for people to relate uh, I think to, you know, all the good things the immigrant community uh, is doing um, in, in the United States. The second thing is that we need to be aggressive about correcting distortions. One of the things that I have learned over the last four years um, is that you can't let anything go. I mean, I, 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 many of us, I mean, I used to kind of take this approach when people would say things that are just outrageous or, uh, you know, even offensive, just kind of, you know, get out of here, you know, just, I'm, I'm just going to not dignify that by giving it a response that we have, we, we, we can't do that, right? We have to respond to every lie and every distortion and every mischaracterization, because if you don't, it becomes the narrative. I remember I was at a, in Dunkin' Donuts before the pandemic, and I had just appeared at a press conference with then mayor, now secretary of labor, Marty Walsh, uh, on, um, you know, on, TPS um, and helping to regularize people who have TPS, helping them regularize their status. And a group of guys was in the corner and they said to me, why are you, why are you um, asking that more criminals come to Worcester? And I didn't know what they were talking about. And then they relate, they pointed to this press conference. And I said, oh, we're, we're talking about temporary protected status holders. I said, well, let me, let me educate you on that. All right. These are people who uh, are, have a legal status, right? These are people who have to pay a fee to register for this status. They have to go through a background check. And every 18 months, they have to go through a background check. So please don't say that these people are criminals. They are the most law-abiding people in our country. Now, how many of you who would gather at that Dunkin' Donuts that they can pass a background check every 18 months, right? Um, you know, my wife always says, use the drive through so you don't have to have those conversations. But here's the deal. I'm not sure if I convinced them, um, you know, to support what we were trying to do, but maybe they won't say that lie again. And I think that that's one of the things that we, we have. We have to correct the distortions. Um, and the other thing is, yeah, I wish the news media would, would, would elevate this. We all have these, right? We all have social media accounts. We can, you know, there's over 100 people that were on this call when we began. If everybody, you know, puts out a positive message, I mean, you know, you're going to reach more people than if it was on the Boston News. So, you know, um, so tell the stories and correct the distortions. Ava, do you have anything to add? Well, I agree with everything that was said that discipline message that discipline the words matter so how we tell the story and the words that we use um, I think that one of the successes of those who have a different point of view that we have is that discipline message uh, and we have to repeat and repeat and as the congressman said use the social media use everything in your power to really tell that story and use the words don't portray immigrants as this um, segment of the population that is a problem and we need to, you know, we need to fix it, but make those stories heard that they are part of who we are as a country. Talk about, you know, the love and togetherness. It's going to take time, but I think each and every one of us with the work and education can change hearts and minds. And we also have to acknowledge that even those who disagree with us, we cannot question their love for the country. 
but the way we talk about it, the acknowledgement of pain that we're in this together and we can really make a difference and that the inclusion of immigrants uh, means an investment in our future and the words that we use and the disciplined message, how we talk about immigrants and part of who we are, uh, I think it's very important as we move forward. And this is the new chapter in the American history. Um, one of the amazing stories is that we have a vice president who is the first new American. She is the daughter of immigrants. So technically she is the new American, uh, the first vice president in the country. So that gives me and all of us the hope that you know this is a new chapter in the American history. And it's a matter of when that we will have a 21st century immigration policy that it's about inclusion and counts the 65.7 million US immigrants and their children as part of who we are as a nation. We are the greatest nation on earth. And I think it's just a matter of time that we will resolve and have a powerful immigration policy that it's economically responsible, politically smart, and represent the values of who we are. Thank you. There are a number of questions from participants for you, Congressman McGovern, as you could have anticipated. So I want to ask you a question specifically. Um, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about the proposal to include a pathway for essential workers as Congress is entertaining the infrastructure bill. Um, and there are also a number of questions that essentially boil down to what do you see as a prospect for a pathway for essential workers, dreamers, and TPS at this time? All right. So, um, you know, uh, a, um, a number of us um, signed a letter to President Biden uh, asking him to, you know, prioritize the inclusion of the Citizenship for Essential Workers Act, um, which would create a pathway uh, to citizenship for millions of immigrant essential workers as part of the, uh, you know, American Families Plan on Infrastructure. Um, and we may be able to do that if we use this process called reconciliation, which is complicated to explain, but it basically allows us to bypass uh, a, a potential filibuster. And, you know, and I, as we have been all saying um, on this call that uh, essential workers have, have proven themselves to be a truly important part of our nation's infrastructure and, a, and an important part of the backbone of this society. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has even designated essential workers as part of our, part of our nation's critical infrastructure. So there's a fit here. And, um, you know, and, and look, here is kind of the problem uh, that we have faced on, whether it's on this, on this one we're talking about now or on TPS or Dreamers, is that the majority of the American people are with us on this. They favor this. Right. We even uh, have a majority in the House that has gone on record as favoring this. And I believe, you know, if there wasn't a thing called the filibuster, that a majority of United States senators would have supported some of these bills, if not all of them. Uh, and so, you know, when we talk about the infrastructure bill as a potential place to address this issue, um, we, we're saying that, you know, um, that we, that we may be able to move it forward again and avoiding all the procedural um, pitfalls that usually happen in the in the Senate. So um, you know we're, we are in consultation with President Biden and Vice President Harris. We're working with the Senate uh, again. Uh, we're, we're you know uh, Congressman Castro of uh, of Texas is is kind of leading this effort, but um, you know I've told him as Chairman of the Rules Committee I will do everything I can to make sure that we can move this forward. Uh, and again, you know, I, we, we talked about what, what, what's unique about this moment. You know, the stars are aligned a little bit. We have a Democratic controlled House, a Democratic controlled Senate, and a president and a de Democrat president, vice president. I hope we have that for the next 100 years. Right. But the only thing we know for certain is that we have it for two years. So our approach legislatively has to be, we have to get things done in these next two years. Uh, we can't push this off any longer. Uh, so the opportunity is now, the American people support this. Let's, let's give the American people what they want. Um, and, um, you know, and let's ignore the demagogues 
um, who are opposed to anything uh, to help immigrants. Let's let's do the right thing. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask one final question of all panelists, and then I'll give you all a chance to to give any kind of final closing uh, comments before I hand it back to Ava. Um, the final question is pivoting a little bit to to a different, very closely related topic. Um, even as Congress debates, you know, all these various pieces of immigration legislation, why do you feel that it is important for the states um, to stay, step up their efforts to protect and integrate immigrant communities? And, and what role do you think the states should play in Massachusetts in particular? And how can our federal congressional offices contribute to this work? Um, I don't know if you want to start us off, Congressman. Look, I mean, this, this is a good question. I mean, the states have often been leaders uh, on immigration matters, um, and they've been the innovators. Um, or sometimes, you know, um, you know, if states are going in the wrong direction, that's an, an, an invitation for Congress to um, to move, uh, uh, you know, to move, you know, on, on national legislation. Uh, but I think states have been leading the way for a number of years, um, op opposing some of the overly zealous immigration policies, the, the arrests, the, the detentions, the deportations. Uh, they've been they've been um, also leading uh, the way in, in access to vaccinations and testing and and on the issue of recovery, governors and mayors and and um, other community leaders should be talking publicly about the role of immig that immigrants have played in helping us all get through uh, this uh, this pandemic and helping us getting get us getting on the road to uh, to recovery. Um, and our governors can also be a powerful voice to get Congress to move to express the urgency about passing, you know, national legislation. So, uh, so the states can, you know, again, could provide protection um, and can, you know, uh, provide innovative ways to help, you know, uh, you know, help be, welcome our immigrant community. But the states can also lobby Congress and lobby the president and say, it's time to move. Thank you, Ava. Hi. Um, I, the way I see integration and inclusion, even though immigration, it's a federal issue, um, inclusion and integration, it's a state and local issue. And there is so much that can be done at the state level and at the local level to really strengthen the inclusion of immigrants and refugees as part of our fabric. Massachusetts has a long history. One of the few states in the country who had a new Americans agenda under Governor Patrick with a state plan to better include immigrants um, under the leadership of Governor Baker and the strong Massachusetts legislature, amazing programs have been in place uh, and resources for the economic, civic and linguistic integration of immigrants and refugees. But there is still a lot that needs to be done. The essential workers, the unauthorized workers still cannot drive. There, there is no path to driver's license for everyone who drives in Massachusetts. So that could help uh, hundreds and thousands of people to, you know, with their basic right to drive to work and drive their children to school. There is still fear among the uh, immigrant communities to call 911 because they're afraid of what would happen regardless re with regard to their immigration uh, status. Um, and we need to provide um, and policies and legislation at the state level to make people feel safe, to make people feel welcome. So safe communities pending in the legislature it's a no-brainer, so the legislature can act and do that. So as much as we are grateful for all that has been done, I think the state and the local government has a lot in their hands to promote and enhance policies that make Massachusetts an inclusive and welcoming state for everyone. Uh, hi, Th thank you, Eva, and, and thank you, Congressman McGovern. Um, this is Ayn from the Southeast Asian Coalition. Uh, I also would like to add that uh, community-based organizations that serve immigrants and refugees uh, are among the most effective group to empower immigrants and refugees to the level where they will become contributing uh, citizens uh, uh, civically and socially e and economically. Uh, I there's so many immigrants, including undocumented I immigrants, have been volunteering uh, to help the Southeast Asian Coalition with our uh, food program, with our face mask program, with lots of things during the pandemic. 
And I think it's important for us to bring them up to help them to regain their dignity and honor in their humanity. Is as immigrants or refugees, we always felt like we are in debt to this people, to the white folks, to people who give us bread, but actually we contribute a lot. And um, I think in order for us to help them to regain and reclaim their dignity and honor by giving them opportunity to contribute. And how do we do this? I really think that uh, resources for community-based organizations serving and uh, have, been, have, have been helped by immigrants and refugees uh, should be strengthened through funding and resources. So because they are the only most, uh, the only people that could engage the immigrants and refugee community uh, in every city and, sta and, state, and state. And so uh, I would like to see um, uh, more funding for uh, community-based organizations who have been doing this work for a long time and gain the trust from both the states as the cities and the community. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And Ishmael, any final brief comments before we close up? Yeah, uh, I would also, in addition to what Anne was uh, just saying, I would, I, would, I would also like to see the states uh, going down to the different local communities. Because just like in my, in my uh, city where I come from, there are different communities, say, of Haitians, Ugandans, Hung uh, Hungarians, Brazilians. The state should be able to come down to those to those levels and in, and engage the leaders of those communities. Some some organizations are faith based, some are churches, mosques. Those are places where these people go for healing, spiritual healing. So, if more in, engagement is done uh, to those organizations, that would be a very good thing. I also think that uh, the offices of uh, of the different um, uh, mayors for example, and, 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 and congressmen should have specific people that deal with immigration um, uh, staff in their offices. I've had a chance to uh, interact with uh, people from the mayor, uh, office of the former mayor of Boston, Mayor Walsh. Uh, they have a specific office. I've also had a chance to, uh, to, to interact with people from uh, Senator Eddie McKay, they have a, somebody specific. So if every, if, if every organization or office that people look up to get one person or two people that specifically dedicated to issues of immigrants, that would be a very good thing. Thank you. Thank you, Ishmael. And thank you once again to all of our panelists for making time in their busy schedule to join us for this very important discussion. I'm just gonna hand it off to Ava to close us out. Thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, thank you so much to our amazing panel uh, for their thoughtful remarks, for their amazing work. Uh, very, very grateful to each and every one of you, Congressman McGovern, Ishmael, and, and on. Also, a big thank you to each and every one on this call for their questions, but for the work that we do. Uh, we so much value the relationship with each and every one of you. This has been an incredibly rich discussion and um, I am so moved by it. Um, we are looking forward to working with all of you um, as we push for an immigration reform that it meets the needs of the 21st century. Congressman, we are counting on your leadership as the chair of the Rules Committee as the legislation on infrastructure bill moves forward. And we know that you will stand with us. So my heartfelt thanks and thank you so very, very much to all of you.